better life today. That's what we're all about. I'm Bob Heisler, your host, and with me is my wife, Anita, our co-host for this program. We like to bring better life to people, and I just want to thank you for inviting us into your homes today. You'll be pleased you stayed by because we have a program that is par excellence today, and uh, it's part of a series on uh, research for the creation. And uh, we have with us uh, some very special guests. Uh, before we introduce the guests, though, I'd like to ask you to read a Bible text for us, Anita. I'll be happy to. Uh, I'd like to read from Psalms 33, verses 6 and 9. Mm -hmm. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that it goes right along with the creation story in Genesis 1, doesn't it? That is the creation story. That is the creation story. That's right. You know, there are many, many uh, theories about uh, how the world began and the age of the earth. And uh, it's rather confusing because the Bible is very specific about how the world began. But many people uh, doubt the creation story. Our guest today is Dr. Bob Gentry, and we also have his daughter, Patty, Patty Guthrie, with us uh, today. And Dr. Gentry has devoted his life to the study of creation and the Bible record of creation. And so, uh, Dr. Gentry, we're very pleased to have you with us here at Better Life Television, KBLN. And uh, we just want to uh, give you most of the time to talk about uh, your research in the uh, short term of years that this world has uh, been around. And so, Dr. Gentry, tell us, how did you get started with, uh, how did you get uh, interested in research in the age of the earth? First of all, let me say how much I appreciate the opportunity of being with you today on the program. And especially I appreciate Patty Lynn being with me here because sometimes I tend to get too much into the science and she always needs to help bring me back and focus attention on the mm -hmm. essential issue that you have asked mm -hmm. me about this morning. True enough, um, I grew up in a Christian home, not a Seventh-day Adventist, went to high school in those days, you know, they read the Bible in high school and had prayer. Mm -hmm. And as far as I knew, the Bible was true from Genesis to Revelation. Mm -hmm. Went to the university and learned about evolution, biological evolution. And I thought, this is really, really unusual because I had never really questioned Genesis, mm -hmm. Adam and Eve. Anyway, that threw some doubts in my mind. A year later, my brother came to the university with me. He took the same course. He went back and told our dear mother, who was struggling to keep everything together, thinking that we both needed an education to make it in life and to become something for the Lord. Anyway, he went back home and both of us began to enunciate these great truths of evolution. He more than myself, but as I continued my physics curriculum there at the university, more and more it switched from just evolution from the standpoint of biology to evolution to the standpoint of physics, ancient age of the earth supposedly. How did that happen? Why was I swept up so easily into a belief of evolution? Well, because physicists believe that they have the truth with respect to the universe, the laws of nature that govern all of our activities, driving the car, flying the airplane, listening to the radio, television. It all revolves around the fundamental laws of physics. So when I was taught the fundamental laws of physics and electromagnetism, nuclear physics, Newton's laws, in addition to that, at the same time, I was introduced to the theory of evolution, the idea of an ancient age of the earth. But I wasn't told at that particular time the whole story, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Anyway, I graduated from the university believing the earth was old, the fossils were old, the universe came as a result of the Big Bang, went out to the defense industry, and I remembered I was in nuclear physics and went out into the defense industry and I can remember arguing with my fellow scientists very, very strongly in favor of evolution. In other words, I was really into it. Well, that was in Texas. My brother and I went to work there for a number of years. Then my wife and I came back. We 
were there in Orlando, Florida, and I was working in the defense industry again on weapons, nuclear weapons mm. effects. Well, one day, uh, a good friend of mine, atheist, and I were talking right before work one Monday morning, and he mentioned to me that the night before he had heard something unusual on television. Anyway, it prompted my wife and I the next week to listen to the program. And indeed, we did listen to the program, and we became sort of fascinated with what was being said. It was a man by the name of George Vandeman mm. who was on the program. Anyway, someone a few weeks later, a month or two later, called and asked my wife if, she, if we would like to have the take his word Bible pamphlets. Mm -hmm. So we said yes, and so we began to study. My brother lived with us at that time. We all began to study, and more and more we studied, and more and more we thought, this is really interesting. A lot about the Bible I had never heard of before. Of course, I was no Bible student. But in any event, uh, the day came when George Vanneman came to the city of Orlando for a series of meetings. My wife and I, by this time, really wanted to go, and we did go. My dear brother went with us on a number of occasions. He, too, became convinced that what George Vanneman was saying about the Bible you know, really made a lot of sense. Well, George Vandeman came, we heard, we listened, but there was one big problem. And that was when he read the fourth commandment, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see and all that in them is, mm -hmm. and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. I thought, uh-oh, something's wrong. Because as an evolutionist, I still believed in God, but yeah, essentially yeah. I believed in theistic evolution, where the earth evolved over billions and billions of years of time. Anyway, that started a real search in my life, my wife's life, because we couldn't find any answers as to how you can reconcile the long ages of what I felt was scientific evidence for an ancient age of the earth, the universe, so no one could tell us. It was at this time you decided at some point to go ahead and be baptized, but you still weren't reconciled in your mind. You, you took the word by faith, but you weren't sure that science supported it. Thank you for <laughs> introducing that because that is exactly true. Mm -hmm. um, we saw these great truths, and I hope for the best, that really everything really was going to hold together, was going to be consistent. Mm -hmm. One thing we both believed was that you know what the Bible says, you have to take it as it reads, mm -hmm. and then number two, that if God exists, then it has to be, the Bible has to be consistent with itself. Mm -hmm. You can't have the Bible saying one thing and basically uh, the science of the world mm -hmm. saying something different. Mm -hmm. So you wound up continuing your work. You left the defense industry in Florida and you pursued a doctorate in physics at Georgia Tech. And while there you started doing some research. Well, that's true. It was a couple of years later. We went to the University of Florida. My wife got her degree, and then we went to a little college called Walla Walla mm -hmm. for a year. And then I came back to Georgia Tech, and I was teaching there, also working on a PhD in physics. And it was at this time that this issue of the age of the Earth and trying to find a way to get some consistency between the science that I had learned and believed was true and also basically what the Bible has to say. So when I went to Georgia Tech, I immediately approached the chairman of the physics department. And I said, I have a problem. I have become a Seventh-day Adventist, and Seventh-day Adventists believe the Fourth Commandment. To me, that means really six days. But I said, you know, I've, I've learned all about the ancient age of the earth and so forth. He understood that, and he said he used to believe it as well. Anyway, I said, I want to do my thesis topic on a PhD by studying the age of the earth. And by that, that meant studying the rocks of the earth mm -hmm. in various, various ways. Because supposedly, the age of the earth is dependent upon what you find in the rocks in terms of radioactivity and the end product. According to the evolutionary theory, the universe is about, seven, about 17, 14, it changes, uh, yeah. billion <laughs> years. Yeah. It's about 14 billion now. It's, escalates up and down and up and down. Well, nobody living today knows for sure because they weren't there that many years ago. But at any <laughs> rate, the idea is that the substance that forms this earth cooled over millions and billions of, or millions of years of geological time. So he, understanding the Big Bang Theory, focused his 
interest in the rocks because that's where the story he thought would be told. Did they cool over vast ages, as the Big Bang Theory suggests, or were they formed rapidly or even instantly, as you read here in Psalm 33? Yes. Or by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Mm -hmm. By the word, he spake and, and it was, was done. done. Yeah. Didn't take a long time to accomplish God's word. That's but right. he read that, but he wondered. Yeah. So there was a time there where you were looking in the microscope. Looking in the microscope in what are called granite rocks. You're all familiar mm -hmm. with granite rocks mm -hmm. because El Capitan, in California, of course, is one of the most famous ones in the world. Granite rocks are the foundation rocks of all the continents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the Bible, in fact, they're identified. Hebrews 1.10 says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Foundations of the earth, these are the granite rocks, and these are the rocks that I began to study under the microscope. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I got a little bit ahead of the game. I talked to the physics department chairman and said, I have to do this work. I've got to investigate this topic. And he finally came up to me one day as we were eating, and he said, sorry, listen, I can't have you uh, doing this for your thesis topic because although I don't think, I think your chances of finding anything significant, if you were to do this work as a thesis topic, I think your chances of finding something are microscopic. But he said, nevertheless, I can't let you stay here and do your thesis on this topic because what if you did find something? You would want to publish it and publish it in a good journal. And what if they were to accept it? What would happen? All of Georgia Tech would be up in a storm over this issue mm -hmm. because we all believe in evolution. You'll be challenging yeah. the foundations of all of modern science as far as the history of the universe is concerned. I cannot take that chance. If you want to do your thesis and do a PhD here, then you're going to have to do something else. You want to stay here and do a thesis on, you know, on something else, stay here. Mm -hmm. You want to do your research on age of the earth, then the implication was you got to leave. Yeah, so yeah. my wife and I left. How long did it take you to make that decision? Didn't, make any, didn't, didn't take me any time at all. Meaning, uh, let's put it this way, this issue of finding the truth. Mm -hmm. We both had decided, my wife and I both decided, mm -hmm. we were not going to live in this world with apparent contradiction, apparent mm -hmm. potential contradiction. On one hand, you know, the Bible had to be true, yes, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, the uh, scientific evidence was such, yeah. so overwhelming, mm -hmm. I could not believe that God would leave two different sources mm -hmm. of truth mm -hmm. in contradiction. To, people would say to me when I was in the process of looking, mm -hmm. you know, God just is trying to confuse the issue, confuse the people. I said, I don't believe that. And yeah. so this is why it was very important for us to continue. So I left. Patty Lynn at that time was very, very, very small. Mm -hmm. We had another child on the way. And we went through some very, very uncertain financial times. He asked that question because in many people's mind, as you're considering a career and you see here's a path, but this is the way less traveled. This is the road That's less right. traveled. Here's the secure way to finish your doctorate, be able to get um, a position that's well respected in the world, mm -hmm. and you say, was that a difficult decision for you to walk mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. from a certain future to a path you didn't know, he didn't know if he was going to discover anything or yeah. not. Mm -hmm. He was just driven by a dream or a hope, mm -hmm. and you have a family on the way. Those are the kinds of things that's that right. people would weigh, and yeah. often people choose the secure way. The secure way. The secure way from a human viewpoint, mm -hmm. but by faith, he chose mm -hmm. the secure mm -hmm. way in Christ. And, and I might add to that, <clears throat> by a strong foundation in truth, Bible truth. Uh, many people don't have that strong foundation. I like to think of it as the granite foundation, foundation of the world. You had that solid, rock-solid foundation that helped you make that decision, and it made it much easier to make a decision uh, for 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 God's kingdom. I think the key is that he was honest. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand, and we don't want to misjudge, many people out there who believe in evolution are honest people of integrity. And uh, he pursued his work as someone who was honest. And when he saw the word of God being honest hearted, mm -hmm. he believed the word. Mm -hmm. And there are many people today that when they see what's in the word of God and pursue it honestly, the Lord will open up the world to them. Mm -hmm. That's right. When That's they right. see evidence, 
and that's what you're about, is pro mm -hmm. producing the evidence, then they can change their minds. Yeah. So God we want to treat all people as honest, <laughs> even the evolutionists of the world, mm -hmm. as honestly pursuing and mm -hmm. believing mm -hmm. as much as they understand to be true. We just see that the word is the highest science possible known to man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where did your decision to leave lead you? It led me to be without a job <laughs> <laughs> and borrowed a microscope, uh, went up to Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova, Nova Scotia to get sections of this granite rock that I wanted to study under the microscope because these uh, rocks, the granite rocks, presumably held the secret or held the so-called proof of why the earth was so old. You would take a piece of rock and the rock doesn't have, you know, anything stamped on it, but what scientists do is to take the rock, dissolve it, and extract out an element called uranium, for example, mm -hmm. and also the end product which it decays to is lead, and they measure the amount of uranium, the amount of lead, and then they say, well, because uranium always transforms into this end product at a constant rate, then we know, <laughs> for example, that we're using that assumption, they take the ratio mm -hmm. of the beginning and the end, must have taken, you know, 500 million years, a billion, two or three, four million, billion years, so the real question was whether indeed this transformation rate had always been constant. Well, that's what I was studying the rocks to find out mm -hmm. under the microscope. Mm -hmm. Turns out that you have to look under the microscope. Little tiny circular rings are there from a decay of, for example, the element uranium. Like this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this one actually is from the decay mm -hmm. of something else mm -hmm. that I saw under the microscope that I re saw repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly and it really caught my attention, and the reason why it caught my attention is because in contradiction to uranium, which has a very slowly decaying property over billions of years, this particular, the kind of radioactivity, and by the way, what we have here at one point in time was a little speck of radioactivity, mm -hmm. and particles shot out from that little tiny speck of different lengths or ranges distances, and it produced three spherical concentric shells mm -hmm. in this big rock, and it's all microscopic. <clears throat> so by actually slicing the rock very thinly and putting it under the microscope, you're seeing a two-dimensional array, which means, of course, the rings around the center. Well, <clears throat> the reason that this began to attract my attention is because this particular type of radioactivity that exists for, um, only for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, people had seen this kind of, we call them halos. Aptly, you can see why. It's got the little dot, like the bullseye <laughs> pattern. Mm -hmm. Well, people had seen them before, even as early as uh, the early part of the 20th century. <clears throat> they did, never did come to the attention of the scientific community very much until the 1930s. And there, uh, there was a scientist up at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He saw these and he wondered, how did these arise? And there are some like this, three rings, two rings, one ring. And the problem that he faced was that the half-lives, meaning that the rate of decay was so rapid that he couldn't explain it on the basis of the ordinary evolutionary theory. By the ordinary evolutionary theory, we mean <clears throat> at one time the Earth was a molten ball and it began to cool, cool, cool over hundreds of millions and billions of years. Mm -hmm. Well, this type of halo coloration is just like a photograph imprinted in the rock. If it's hot or if it's melted, it all disappears. So the rock had to be solid at the time that this formed. But if it's going to form slowly, if the rock is cooling slowly or hundreds of millions of years, and the radioactivity only exists for only a few minutes or thereabouts, something is wrong. And so in my mind, I was still evolutionary thinking, so to speak, about the origin of the granites cooling over long, long, long periods of time. Yet I saw this, these halos under the microscope in the granite rocks, and the half-life was very, very short. Uh, back in the 1930s, when the papers were published then, the gentleman, the scientist, G.H. Henderson, he proposed some way, somehow, that some other kind of radioactivity was feeding the little centers here, and so it was really what we would call secondary radioactivity. It wasn't primary, it wasn't primordial radioactivity that had formed these halos. And so I bought into that. And for a year or two, as I studied all these halos under the microscope and did some experiments, it all, you know, just would not fit together at all. Because on one hand, 
I kept thinking, ancient age of the earth, ancient age of the earth, long period of cooling for the granite rocks. Mm -hmm. Even though I had accepted and become baptized as Seventh-day Adventist and believed, in essence, the Genesis record of creation as much as I could at that particular time. I mean, I believed it did happen, but I was still unable to reconcile the evidence from science to the Bible. And that's a struggle that many people have today who are Christians. Mm -hmm. They believe the Bible or they claim to believe the Genesis account, but they also believe that the Earth's rocks are very, very old. And mm -hmm. this is the question mm -hmm. that he had in his own mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, remember again, the foundation question I had to begin with was, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea mm -hmm. and all that in them is. So I could not go back and begin to compromise the six days of creation, saying there are six long periods of time like I thought as an mm -hmm. evolutionist, because it says, and all that in them is. Six literal. One thing that really caught my attention was in reading the fourth commandment, and I'm sure I've read it, I had read it earlier in my life, but when I saw, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see it all that in them is, then rested and talked about the seventh day, I had enough sense to know that the seventh day was 24 hours. George <laughs> Vandeman brought that out very, very clearly. And I said, wait a minute, if indeed in the same sentence the word day means 24 hours, it's got to mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. If there's any consistency at all in the Bible, it's got to mean the same thing in the previous six days. So I was through, logically speaking, it was impossible then to go back to the old idea, you know, of the six long cosmic periods of time. It was either all or none, and this is what, you know, basically provided the continuing impetus to find mm -hmm. out what in the world was going on. So one day I was looking under the microscope after I had left Georgia Tech, Patty Lynn and the others were sleeping, and I was looking under the microscope at these little tiny halos under the microscope, and I was wondering to myself, what in the world is going on? I cannot figure this out. I'd been praying, my wife mm -hmm. and I had been praying for a long time. I told her of this enigma, this mystery that I mm -hmm. could not solve, something I could not reconcile. But as I was looking at it under the microscope one day, one afternoon, the house was very, very quiet, and I tell the story here in the book, Creation's Tiny Mystery. The thought occurred to me, the verses in the Bible occurred to me that you read earlier. Mm -hmm. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done, he commanded, and it stood fast. Ooh, it just, light, dawn, just like that. I realized that the God of heaven, these rocks that I had thought were evolutionary and evolutionary origin, were really rocks that God had called into existence when he created the earth on day one. Mm -hmm. Everything just made all the sense in the world from then on, mm -hmm. I thought. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And so um, I had a very good friend, who, a minister who had been very interested in what I was doing, and so that night I went over to see him and brought the great news that here I had found this evidence. God had revealed this, so to speak, as mm -hmm. I was looking under the microscope, the implications of what he had put in the rocks. His own fingerprints. I thought ahead, just like I had become an evolutionist because I thought I had seen the scientific light, that God here in the last days was revealing his evidence of creation to substantiate belief, faith in the Bible, just like Jesus worked miracles to substantiate the faith of the people of his day that he was the Messiah. It just made all the mm -hmm. sense. Anyway, I went to see my friend that night, that night and basically said, um, here, this is what I found. This is what the Lord has shown me, so to speak. Evidence for creation, his fingerprints. And the dear friend said, well, Bob, you better be careful. You may have made a mistake. The next night I went to see some other people who were financially supporting us, told them the same thing. Bob, better be careful, you may have made a mistake. And immediately I decided the only way this information would get out to the world and be tested and examined <clears throat> would be to actually begin publish the results of experiments mm -hmm. in the world's best scientific journals, bring it before the attention of the world and see if anyone can shoot it down. That's the real test of science. <clears throat> you have a new theory, you've got to write it up, you've got to publish it, you've got to see what the scientific community has to say about it and then move forward with more and more experiments. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> that's the way I began to think and that's the way we began to pray. Mm -hmm. So there in Decatur, Georgia, we did some experiments and sent in the results to a scientific journal and the paper was published. Mm -hmm. It didn't say very much. 
And then I tried to publish another paper very quickly after that in which I brought out the implications that we just talked about. And in the, as the book says here, the referee, when I really presented the implications, he just blew up and uh, basically said, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But he said, if I would simply restate the, implica restate the experimental work and expand on it, then send it back in for publication, then, you know, the scientific community would be more willing to at least listen to what he had to say. Mm -hmm. So um, that basically provided the foundation for us in God's providence to go from the little one-room laboratory we had there in our home, got an invitation to go up to Columbia Union College for a couple of years, and uh, that uh, opened the door further mm -hmm. because we were able then to have a small laboratory at Columbia Union College to pursue this evidence for creation in the process of writing up results of experiments and sending it out to uh, scientific journals, mm -hmm. hopefully in the process of getting it out to the scientific community all over the world, and from there to bring to the attention of the whole world, one way or the other, what we have found. Mm -hmm. Well, you have spent many, many years uh, researching uh, this fascinating topic. And uh, I'd like to have you hold the book up uh, for just a moment or two. There might be some viewers that would like to uh, get this book. Uh, turn it toward the camera right there. There okay. you go. Creation's Tiny Mystery by Robert V. Gentry. And uh, if someone would like to buy a copy of this book, where would they find it? First of all, you can go to an 800 number, 1-800-467-6380, or you can go to our website, www.halos.com, or you can write to Earth Science Associates, mm -hmm. P.O. Box 12067, Knoxville, Tennessee, mm -hmm. 37912. All right, thank you. And Patty Lynn, you've got some DVDs there. Um, quickly tell us uh, what they are. The first one, Fingerprints of Creation, mm -hmm. describes in depth the evidence for mm -hmm. the halos found in the rocks. Mm -hmm. The Young Age of the Earth mm -hmm. highlights many very interesting things about the Young Age evidence. Mm -hmm. And finally, we'll be talking about the center of the universe, the model of the whole universe. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Patty Lynn and Dr. Gentry. This has been a fascinating subject, and I'm sure we all want to learn more about it. So please come back next week, and we'll have the uh, second program on the age of the Earth. Yes. All right. And our guest today uh, is returning, uh, Dr. Bob Gentry and his daughter, Patty Lynn Guthrie. And so Dr. Gentry and Patty Lynn, welcome once again to thank Better you. Life Today. Um, we, we left off last week with uh, your not being able to do a doctorate in creation because uh, the your head of your department at Georgia Tech was afraid that you might find something that would be controversial and it would be very difficult for the university. So you decided to leave and go and uh, do your uh, research somewhere else. And uh, so where did you go and uh, what did you do and how did you get your work published? Well, remember that when I left, I went home and carved out a little spot in our house to set up the microscope and examine the rocks mm -hmm. under the microscope for a while. And then I had an invitation to go to Columbia Union College. Some people there found out that I was working and I'd published just a small paper and hadn't got very much notoriety or much attention in the scientific community. You want to tell them where Columbia Union College is. The oh, location yes. became pivotal. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, Tacoma Park, Maryland, right outside, as you well know, mm -hmm. of Washington, D.C., the hub of many of America's great scientific institutions. So as I was there, began to do research, they set up a little laboratory for me, and I began to do experiments. Remember that my view was in order for anything to be credible at all within the scientific community and in the world, it had to be published. You have to do experiments, write it up. It goes in, it goes through what is called the peer review process. And so that was my aim and my goal. So after going to Columbia Union College and beginning to do experiments there, again, I was focusing on sending a paper in to the world's best scientific journals, one of which, of course, is science. 
whose headquarters happens to be there in downtown Washington, D.C. About how far was that from your office? Where you only were? about five miles. <laughs> wow. <laughs> only about five miles. Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> in any event, after continuing a series of experiments for about a year or so, I was in the process of writing up the paper and sending it in for publication. And earlier I had recognized that if I said too much at one time about the implications, and by the way, the new series of experiments, which took about six or eight months, the new series of experiments basically affirmed that the radioactivity which formed these halos like this mm -hmm. with a short, short half-life, that the radioactivity like this <coughs> forming uh, these halos was not a secondary type of radioactivity. It was what we would call primordial, made in the beginning, made at creation. Mm -hmm. But I did not dare put this in the paper because this would have exposed the whole paper to primordial. That has to be creation. That means, mm -hmm. and so because it's such a short half-life, then of course the scientists would have said, wait a minute, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I sent the paper in and went out for review. It came back and one referee said, go ahead and publish the paper. The other referee said, well, there's something about here I don't understand what Gentry has said. So the editor there at the journal, associate editor, sent it back to me, said, here's the referee report, you know, modified, mm -hmm. sent it back in. It was almost as if, you know, the paper was going to be published. But in my mind, I was thinking, well, this is an opportunity to make it stronger, the implications mm -hmm. stronger. Mm -hmm. So I did. I didn't make it a whole lot stronger. Do you think you were naive right then? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could say that, but you know, given the opportunity, I always push ahead. Anyway, anyway, I, I did that. And so uh, the paper went back in for publication, just went back to this referee, <coughs> and uh, this referee this time saw that what I basically was saying was that the general view, Big Bang view, is the Earth, I mean, the universe was formed in some sort of, you know what, blowing apart from nothing and so forth. And then gradually the atoms and so forth collapse, and finally galaxies form, stars form, galaxies form. And sooner or later, there's something called a hot proto-sun. Something blob comes off the hot proto-sun, which is presumably the hot Earth. Cools down, cools down over hundreds of millions of years. <clears throat> but how did the elements that actually formed the Earth and the stars, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well. In the Big Bang, only two elements are supposedly coming from the Big Bang, and that's hydrogen and helium. Well, today we've got 92 elements. Where do they all come from? Well, the scientists who don't know anything about what's going on, really, they speculate that indeed these elements are formed in the stellar interiors of stars that explode. So-called neutron reactions build up the elements. And so, in their view, all everything that exists in the Earth today, us included, except the hydrogen and helium, <coughs> actually formed as a result of these supernova type explosions, building up elements, and then finally recollecting to form the Earth. So they have then what is called a marker, and that marker is the time period between when the elements were created or formed or synthesized in a supernova to the time that the Earth actually formed. It's mm -hmm. called extinct natural radioactivity. Well, <coughs> in this, <coughs> pardon me, in this paper that I had sent in for publication, I only barely mentioned the possibility of the polonium halos, creation halos, uh, representing extinct natural radioactivity. But the second time I sent it in, I inferred that much, much more strongly. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, what I was basically saying is the time period from nucleosynthesis in the so-called distant, distant millions and hundreds of millions of years ago in the universe to the time that the rocks formed, I was collapsing all of that. I was saying there's scientific mm -hmm. evidence, <coughs> pardon me, Scientific evidence to collapse all that to just a few minute period of time. Mm -hmm. Well, this referee saw what I said. And so mm -hmm. he wrote back to the editor and said, you know, Gentry has really, he's got some interesting, very interesting observations, but we can't, I cannot agree that this paper should be published. In any event, I, the editor wrote me a letter. Instead of just agreeing that that would be the case, I called and spoke to him, went down to Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. met him in his office, and um, <clears throat> first thing he did, you know, when I came in the door, he knew I was there. I'd called and told him I was there wanting to talk to him about this paper. Mm -hmm. 
He said, you know, you're from Columbia Union College, aren't you? And obviously, I said, well, sure, that's what the paper says. He said, you're a Seventh-day Adventist, aren't you? I said, I am. He said, you believe the earth is only 6,000, no, pardon me. He asked me, how old do you think the earth is? I said, 6,000 years. <laughs> he said, I want you to know I'm an evolutionary geologist. He's the associate editor of the paper. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> anyway, I sat down and he kindly allowed me to talk to him for about an hour or so of the paper. <clears throat> and as a result of that, uh, we got on pretty good terms and I came back the next day and talked to him again about the implications. And he said, abbreviating some of what really transpired, <clears throat> But he sent the paper out again, this time to world-renowned authorities in the field of nuclear physics and geochemistry. He saw enough with the knowledge he had of geology to see that it looked like, you know, these referees really did not answer the question of the halos themselves. They were simply saying the mindset or the conventional view had to be right, and so that's yeah, why yeah. something had to be wrong. So anyway, he sent it out to these other referees, world-renowned authorities, and I'll tell you how I know that in just a minute. And at the same time um, that was going on, <clears throat> in May now of that year, I had been on a very widely listened to radio program, radio interview, for five hours in Denver, Colorado. I was being interviewed because word had gotten around that I had found evidence, so to speak, for a creation. And there was a chemistry professor at the University of Colorado had this widely listened to radio program every Saturday night I don't know what 10%, 20%, 30% of Denver usually tuned mm -hmm. in. I was on for five hours. And he had all of his buddies who were evolutionists jumping on the phone lines whenever, you know, the time came to be asking questions. Why do you think a chemistry professor in Denver who has a very well-known <coughs> talk show would want to have a crea someone who might disparage uh, evolution on his show? Well... The fact of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, most people who are scientists either are atheists, agnostics, or they are theistic evolutionists. Mm -hmm. Here I was coming in with evidence he knew that showed indeed this was fiat creation, the Bible supported creation. Mm -hmm. And so they don't like that. Mm -hmm. And they'll do, uh, I, won't do, I won't say they'll do anything, but they have done many, many things to prevent this information to getting out to the world on that particular program that Saturday night. He was doing everything he could to set things up in such a way as to presumably call into question what I had found at that particular time. Well, it went on like that and just criticism, 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 criticism. About nine o'clock that night, we started at seven, he got a call from his station manager and his station manager was saying, you're not making any progress. In other words, you're really not being successful in spite of the fact you've got all these guys calling in to question mm -hmm. what Gentry has done you're still not making a whole lot of progress. You've got to do something else. So he went on <laughs> more and more abrasive to me over the mm -hmm. air, you know, very much insulting and so forth. How do you know this? How do you know that? Anyway, it went on like that until about 11 o'clock that night. And then someone called in, and I'll say it on television. I think it was an angel of heaven. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he uh, very calmly began to ask the question. He said, well, what's the situation here? you got Gentry on the one hand, he says he's been doing experimental work here for several years and he's arrived at these conclusions on the basis of his experimental work. And I'd had one paper published at that particular mm -hmm. time. And so it was in a, uh, a nationally recognized scientific journal. In fact, it was in Nature. It was my mm -hmm. first paper in a real scientific journal, but I didn't say a whole lot. I just said that I found this phenomena and anyway, but the word got out very quickly that this was challenging the conventional viewpoint of Earth's history and the age of the Earth and everything else. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that night, that gentleman who called in, the angel of heaven called in, <laughs> he asked, instead of the, the uh, questions being focused now to me, directed to me, he asked the questioner, the doctor of chemistry there at the University of Colorado, he said, now, Gentry has been telling us all this information about the experimental work he's done and the implications. He said, what is your basis for criticizing Gentry's work? He said, well, I went to the library yesterday. <laughs> I went to the library yesterday and read up on a few things relating to his work and the background of what he's doing with the halos. And so the questioner asked, or he said, do we understand that Gentry's been doing the work here, experimental work, for several years, and he does have one paper in the scientific literature in Nature, a well-recognized scientific mm -hmm. international journal, 
No one has criticized that work in that journal. He's following the scientific protocol of doing experiments and getting it out to the scientific community. No one has basically called into question his results as yet. On the other hand, we have you saying you went to the library yesterday <laughs> <laughs> and it, it just unfolded. He, he hit the ceiling at that particular time. What do you mean? You know, what do you mean? I've done library research. And the questioner said, that's just the point. You've been doing, you've been criticizing him on the basis of doing a one afternoon library research. This man has been doing experimental work in the laboratory and publishing for several years now. What sense does that make? Anyway, and just changed the whole complexion of the radio program. All the people he still had lined up to call in and mm -hmm. criticize me and put me down and so forth, they disappeared. Mm -hmm. They didn't call in because they saw a huge hole had been shot in the man's case. Mm -hmm. And so from then on till 12 o'clock that night, the people who had been waiting to get through, waiting on the phone lines to get through to say something positive or ask mm -hmm. me a, a simple question, they got through. And so for the last hour, the Lord worked in the way that indeed the evidence began yeah. to go out. And for years after that, I would meet people who said, you know, I heard you on that radio program there in Denver. Well, in any event, getting back now, I have to switch gears. That's still mm -hmm. the same year. I've sent the paper in for publication. Uh, it was sent in, and this time now something happened which nor normally never happens. One of the reviewers now, a world-renowned authority in geochemistry, radio chemistry, wrote back the review and sent it to the editor saying, you know, there are some things here that just are really unusual. There are some things I don't understand. What is he saying? He put down his name and his number. He said, I want this man, this scientist, if he wants to, to call me, get in touch with me. So the editor sent me that report. And I immediately called him and talked to him, got him on the telephone. He was a professor of radiochemistry at Carnegie Mellon University. Truman Coleman at that particular time was his name, Dr. Truman Coleman, professor of chemistry at Carnegie Mellon University. Well, anyway, I called him and I told him who I was, and he immediately said, you know, I know you. You know, I, I asked, of course, for you to contact me. He just went right to the point. What is going on with that paper you have about these halos? What do you think the implications are? You don't say what the implications are in the paper. And I said, fine. I said, the implications are that God created the rocks. It's evidence God left in the rocks for fiat creation. Mm -hmm. Silence on the other end of the line. I remember I'm talking to a world authority yeah, yeah. in the field of radiochemistry. World authority has published, I don't know how many papers on the age of the earth. Here he knows and talking to me that if what I'm saying is true, Everything he's ever done is out the window. It's mm -hmm. nothing. And so we continued to talk after he got back on the line and said, mm -hmm. you know, his father, grandfather had been a, a Methodist minister. We went on like that for a minute or two. And anyway, after he calmed down, he said, well, you know, what about this? What about this? What about this? And I talked to him about an hour or so on the telephone. He said, well, I assume you still want to get the paper published. And I said, absolutely. He said, well, here are some suggestions for other experiments I want you to do, <laughs> which in this case would have had to be done at a national laboratory. So I said, fine, I'll see what I can do about getting to a national laboratory just for the purpose of doing these experiments, mm -hmm. and I'll rewrite the paper and I'll send it back in again. Well, I didn't even know whether the editor was going to, associate editor was going to give me that opportunity because there was still another referee that was still mm -hmm. to come in and bring his, ref his report. Anyway, it so turns out that that fall, I was invited to go to speak at the University of Colorado Physics Colloquium by the world-renowned George Gamow, one of the men who have basically formed or developed the Big Bang Theory. In fact, if you go to the um, Smithsonian Museum of Air and Space Museum, Space. they have a whole section in that exhibit on um, the Big Bang and Dr. George Gamow is featured in that exhibit mm -hmm. at the Smithsonian, and some of these other people he's talking about. You can see them in the Smithsonian. The story is all there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and so what you can, you can see the situation that was developing. In May of that year, I was on that widely listened to radio program. I don't know, 100,000 more people were there listening that evening. So it was widely known in Denver and Boulder and many places, of course, in Colorado, and yet I was now being asked to go back now and give a physics colloquium in Boulder, which is where the professor of chemistry actually taught. Mm -hmm. The professor who had interviewed you on the radio. That's right. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what in the world is going to be happening under these conditions. 
Well, at the, at, when I received this information from uh, George Gamow inviting me to come to the University of Colorado that fall, I got in touch with him. And I'm a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. And so he said, we, I want you to stay at my home. And so I said, fine, I'll be happy to. I said, I'm a vegetarian. He said, well, have your wife get in touch with my wife. And so my wife sent a letter to her <laughs> telling her, she asked, you know, whether I can eat fish and so forth. And I, I said, no. <laughs> anyway, things were going on very well. And I finally, that fall, got to Boulder. A number of things happened before getting there. But anyway, I got to Boulder <coughs> and expecting, of course, to stay at his home, called his home, and his wife said he wasn't there. He had had a carotid artery mm. surgery, and he was recovering. He was fully recovering, but he's still in the hospital. And that he wanted me to come by and see him there mm -hmm. at the hospital. So I did. <clears throat> now, at the same time, uh, I had information, inside information, which ordinarily you never have if you're uh, an author writing, trying to get something published. Mm -hmm. I called the editor there, associate editor of science, mm -hmm. and uh, I told him that I had gotten this tremendous invitation to go and speak at the University of Colorado from no less than George Gamow. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> why was that so significant? Because George Gamow, the father, so to speak, of the Big Bang, here I was finding evidence that basically collapsed everything from the Big Bang down from, you know, billions and billions and billions of years of matter spewing everywhere and galaxies forming, stars forming, and finally the Earth supposedly cooling down into, you know, hundreds of millions of years later. Mm -hmm. I was finding something that overturned all of that. Mm -hmm. Now here, though, George Vanman wanted me to come and stay at his home. Gamow, not Van. <laughs> yeah. Gamow, George Gamow wanted me to come mm -hmm. and to stay at his home and have the colloquium and so forth. So in any event, uh, You're there at the hospital. I was there at the hospital and talking with him, and mm -hmm. I thought by this time that um, he understood what was going on. He understood mm -hmm. the implications. So I began to talk with him on the basis of, you know, isn't it interesting, you know, that I've, well, first of all, he said, you know, these halos that you have found, they're very, very, very interesting. And so I thought that was an invitation for me to expand on mm -hmm. the implications. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I began to do it. I didn't jump. I began to do it very gently. And it didn't, he came back with a response that seemed to indicate he didn't understand what I was saying. Mm. I thought to myself, that's strange. So I presented it a little bit more strongly, that indeed, mm -hmm. here are the polonium halos. They're in the granite. They've got a very short half-life. There is no other radioactivity that could possibly be before the polonium that formed this. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, there's some really interesting implications, aren't there? And so he again gave me an answer that indicated he didn't really understand what, he didn't even listen or hear what I was saying. Mm. So I did it a third time. I became, <coughs> I got more strongly involved in actually <laughs> presenting the fact that this radioactivity has only a short half-life, normal Big Bang, as you well know, talking to Gamow, that, you know, it's, it, you can't have, you gotta have long, long, long half-lives in order to survive from nucleosynthesis down to the time of the Earth's crust. Mm -hmm. Here we have something, it's so short it just collapses everything. And again, he didn't say anything R reasonable with response to what I was saying. And then it hit me. <clears throat> the Lord of heaven and earth has closed the mind, the guy's, the scientist's eyes, closed mm -hmm. his eyes, closed his ears. He doesn't understand what I'm saying. When he reviewed that paper, he saw the technical aspects of the polonium halos, and he saw the experiments were valid. He saw everything I'd done was valid and mm -hmm. experimentally. <clears throat> But he didn't understand that it was collapsing and overthrowing the Big Bang. Hmm. So I stopped, meaning mm -hmm. I, I didn't pursue the topic any further. And I changed, mm -hmm. so we talked about other things. And he said, you know, it's too bad I'm not going to be able to be at your colloquium tomorrow. But I have all my associates, and they're very anxious to hear what you have to say because, anyway, talk to them. Mm -hmm. So I went b because of that, and I knew that there was this possibility that this chemistry professor there at the University of Colorado was going to be there, he should be there, and that he was going to do everything in this world to publicize the fact this guy, you know, he feels the implications of what he has told us today are creation. <laughs> well, that would have gotten, if that happened, that would have gotten back to Gamow. Gamow could have retracted mm -hmm. what he said about the publication of mm -hmm. Hoover approving the paper for publication. So that's the last <laughs> thing in the world I wanted. Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately, the pastor who had baptized myself and, and my, my wife and I back in Orlando, Florida earlier, uh, seven years earlier at that particular time, 
He was now the pastor of the Boulder Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. So I called him and talked to him, and there were several other individuals, Adventists, who had heard me speak several months earlier there on radio. They went over to his house. We all prayed, Lord of heaven and earth, you know, the situation. We want to get this paper published. We want to get it out to the world in a way that is credible and let the whole world take a look at it scientific, mm -hmm. community-wise. If they find anything wrong, that's well, fine, and good. We're searching for the truth. But if they don't, then what's going on? The evolutionists then are being quiet because they can't resolve the, uh, mm -hmm. can't uh, answer the evidence. Anyway, I went over to the university that afternoon, and immediately the secretary met me. I told her who I was and so forth, and she said, oh, Mr. Gentry, so sorry, so sorry. Uh, first of all, she talked to me about Gamow, and I knew about Gamow, and I said I'd been to see him. Then she said, the other thing is, the chairman of the physics department just had to go home 10 minutes ago. He's come down with the flu, mm. or something like that. So he couldn't be here, but he wanted to, me to express my sincere appreciation for your coming, how much he wanted to be there to hear what you had to say. Then she said, something else, <coughs> something else has occurred. The CIA has been at the University of Colorado campus a couple of weeks ago, and they've been recruiting, and the whole campus is stirred up because they don't want these guys here. They don't want the recruiters. They're stirring up, you know, all sorts of problems. And so now there's going to be an emergency meeting of not only the Senate faculty, but the entire university faculty at 4 o'clock this afternoon, exactly the time you're scheduled for your oh colloquium. My. And she said, I'm afraid just about all of our faculty, except one, is going to be there. Of course, there'll be graduate students there and others, you know, who are not actually among the faculty itself. They'll be there. <clears throat> so I spoke. There was one faculty member who introduced me. They, all the students heard what I had to say. I explained the evidence, mm -hmm. but I did not finish off the climax. I did not say, this is evidence that collapses everything in the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. So afterward, the professor said, came up to me and he said, you know, this is really puzzling, isn't it? What you have found is really puzzling. How are we going to explain this information? He said, George Gamow, Professor Gamow, you know, is really interested in your work. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the Lord overruled. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and as a result of that, um, George Gamow, the approval that he had for the paper still persisted, and still we had the other referee mm -hmm. from the University, uh, from mm -hmm. Carnegie Mellon University. And we'll have to deal with that here next time, I guess. All right, all, all right, time. let's do uh, it. In the uh, few moments we have left, would you like to hold up your book there? Perhaps some of our viewers would uh, like to get a copy of it called Creation's Tiny Mystery by Robert V. Gentry. And tell them where they can uh, purchase this book. All right, you can go to our website, www.halos.com. You can order it if you want to write to Earth Science Associates, P.O. Box 12067, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37912. Or you can call 1-800 Four six seven six three eight zero. All right, thank you. And Patty Lynn, you have some uh, DVDs there. Quickly uh, tell us what they are. We have Fingerprints of Creation, The Young Age of the Earth, mm -hmm. and Center of the Universe, mm -hmm. all describing dis different aspects of the work that Dad has done. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Well, we want to thank you very much uh, for this segment of the series on uh, creation and the uh, short life of the earth. And, and be sure to tune in next week. Next week we'll have the third uh, program uh, on this uh, topic. And uh, so we want to thank you very much for being here today and for the research that you have done over the years. And I'm excited. I can just hardly wait to hear uh, what happened with your publication. And also there's a trip that you took to Russia that's going to be very fascinating. So come back next week. Welcome back, Dr. Gentry and uh, uh, Patty Lynn, your, his daughter. Uh, we're glad to have you back for Thank this you. third segment. Now, last, uh, the last time we uh, were on, we talked about uh, your getting a paper um, published, because that's the way the scientific <laughs> community works. You, f you, you, you research, you make a finding, and then you publish a paper. And the reviews that you get will determine 
whether or not that is accepted or not. And so we were just right on the verge of getting the acceptance of a publication of your paper in the uh, journal, I believe it's Science, That's there correct. in Washington, D.C. <coughs> so what happened when you went back to the editor? Well, after I came back from the trip there to Boulder, mm -hmm. I That's called the editor and told him I felt good things had happened. Uh, I told him exactly what I told Gamow and what happened with Gamow and didn't seem to phase him. Remember now, I'm talking to an evolutionary geologist mm -hmm. who understands that basically we have really found something that apparently challenges all the Earth history that he has learned, Big Bang and so forth. But still there was the other referee, the mm -hmm. one up at mm -hmm. Carnegie Mellon University, the one that said I needed to go and do more experiments mm. and write it up and then send it in and he would take a look at it. Well, the Lord opened the door for me to um, meet some people, scientists, down at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory who were willing to basically allow me to come down and do some experiments for a short period of time, mm -hmm. for about a week, and I did. Uh, the laboratory graciously opened the door for me to go down and do these experiments. I took the results back and wrote them up and put them in a new version of the paper now, about the third or fourth time, and <clears throat> sent it in for, well, pardon me, before I sent it in for publication, I called Professor Coleman mm -hmm. of Carnegie Mellon. I was at Columbia Union College, and I said I'd done all the experiments that he had asked me to do, and I'd written it up, got a new paper. <clears throat> and I said, before I send it in, however, I want to actually come up and talk with you about this, if this is possible. And you see, this is un just unheard of. Mm -hmm. for a scientist who is trying to get a controversial paper published, not only to be able to talk to someone like this over the telephone, but to actually go and see him. Mm -hmm. He said, all right, you can come up. In fact, I said, well, I was going to fly him. He said, that's fine, I'll meet you at the airport. And he did. All right. Well, all the way from the airport to his office at Carnegie Mellon University, we continued to talk. And again, now the topic of the implications mm -hmm. came up very, very clearly. And in the process of going from the airport to his office, he said that I believe the devil put the fossils in the rocks. Mm -hmm. You know, there are fossils in all sorts mm -hmm. of uh, sedimentary rocks. I said, no. I said, those were from the flood. And again, he mentioned his grandfather, Baptist, uh, Methodist minister mm -hmm. and so forth. Well, we got to his office and I had this new copy of the paper. So we sat down. He was at his desk. I was sitting next to him. And so it began. Going through the paper, not just paragraph by paragraph or mm -hmm. sentence by sentence or mm -hmm. word by word, but comma by comma and <laughs> exclamation point by exclamation point. Just absolutely mm -hmm. infinite Fine detail. Comb. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Examining everything that I had said and my new results. Well, it went to lunchtime. We took a break and came back after lunchtime. It went on and on and on. Finally, you know, late in the afternoon, he says, there are some things here that you have found that I think might bear more result, might bear more investigation. But he said, but he said, even as it is right now, there are things that you have found and discovered that I cannot understand. Mm -hmm. And on the way back then from his office to the airport, he said, if you go back and adjust the paper, you know, piddly things that he had mm -hmm. found, the sentence changes, words change, whatever, mm -hmm. but nothing of any essence whatsoever. If you go back and rewrite it now to make these changes I've suggested and send it back in for publication, I'll consider it. Mm -hmm. But he said, if you say anything about God, mm -hmm. I'll turn it down. I'll mm -hmm. turn it down. I will not. Mm -hmm. Okay, for publication. I said, fine. So I went back, and this is now January or thereabouts, uh, 1968. Well, I worked very hard and I got it back in from publication. I went back and I told the associate editor my conversation with Professor Coleman. I said, you know, from my standpoint, <clears throat> the evidence is there. Mm -hmm. And he was, by this time, he was not surprised with what I told him about the evidence. <clears throat> Pardon me, about the reaction of Professor Coleman and the evidence. So I worked on it for a couple of weeks and sent it back in, January 1968. Now this paper had gone in for, it had been in for publication for a long, long time by this point because it had gone through multiple reviews. Mm -hmm. In fact, I haven't mentioned everything. It would take too long. 
But it had gone through multiple reviews, and I'd been back and forth. Anyway, it went back in for publication about January 1968. And I expected, you know, to hear something very, very soon, because I had talked with Coleman, you know, at great length, and he didn't have any other things he could say, and I had done exa did exactly what he asked me to do. Anyway, January passed. No word from the referee. And so mm -hmm. I would call science, talk to the associate editor. Have you heard anything from Professor Coleman? Nothing. February came, first week, second week, third week, fourth week. February, nothing. Mm -hmm. Then came March, first week, second week, third week, fourth week. All March was gone. Now, interestingly, I had the American Geophysical Union has its annual, had its annual meeting there in Washington, D.C. at that particular time, and I had an abstract in for the annual meeting of the American Geophysical Union there in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. in the spring of 1968 in April. Mm -hmm. Well, of all things, it turned out that Truman Coleman also had an abstract, not only in the same program, but his abstract was right adjacent to mine in the same program. We were going to speaking at the same mm -hmm. uh, section, so to speak. And I had turned in now an abstract which talked about the young age of the Earth. Mm -hmm. Talked about the young age of the Earth. Well, one thing I did not want to happen was for him to come to the American Geophysical Union to give his paper and me to stand up and say right after that, I got this evidence for a young age of the Earth. Mm -hmm. I thought this was just going to be way, way, way too much. He, you know, it's more than he could stomach. But anyway, um, it turned out that, you know, March passed, first week in April passed and so forth, and still nothing from him. Mm -hmm. So I went to the AGU and I presented my paper. I didn't know what was going to happen. Obviously, I prayed just like mm -hmm. I did before the Gamow situation. And it turns out he wasn't there. The associate that I had met up at Carnegie Mellon when I went up there in January, he came down to give the paper. But he heard what I had to say about the evidence for a young age of the earth. And obviously he went back and told Coleman what I had to say. But still, there was no, I didn't receive anything. The editor had not received anything. And so we continued to pray. You know, so at some point, we better jump through this story a little bit. Editor called you and said, "How did you find out that he had a review on his desk?" Oh wait, okay, now that's <laughs> we're getting. To, that's the punchline of all this. <laughs> that's right. I'm glad you reminded me. Yeah. Um, over and over again, I would call and nothing was available. Mm -hmm. But now it's in May, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what was happening, and so I had called, you know, repeatedly over a period of several months, and nothing had happened. So I called one day and asked for the associate editor. And they said, oh, we're sorry to have to tell you that he's in the hospital, in the hospital. He's not available. Mm. And so I said to the person who answered the telephone, well, can you tell me what has happened to my paper? I haven't heard anything now about my paper for four or five months. And they went and looked, and they couldn't find any record of my paper whatsoever. And I said, something is wrong. This paper has been in for publication, you know, almost a year. And I know that mm -hmm. it's been... In, through multiple reviews, you've got to be able to find something. They went and looked again, couldn't find anything about the paper. And here the associate editor was in the hospital, and I almost gave up hope. I said, Lord, what in the world? The last man in the world who would have done something, mm -hmm. even if something favorable had come in, if they went back and looked at all those reviews, 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 anybody else in the editorial office would have said, no way. The one man that could have said, yes, he's in the hospital, Lord. Mm -hmm. So what does this all mean? But anyway, she came back and said, nothing was there. And I said, it's got to be there. It's got to be there. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, wait just a minute. There's one place I did not look. She said, I'll go look. And she did. And she came back and she said, I found it. I said, where was it? She said, it's on the copy editor's desk. I said, the copy editor's desk? That means it's been okay for publication? She said, yes. It's going through for publication. I said, thank you. And I hung up the telephone. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well. Send uh, it in. <laughs> well, they sent it to me then to yeah. check it for the final publication uh -huh. to see if there was any last minute yeah. changes. Isn't that, isn't that article, didn't it, is it in here, in your appendix? You know it is. <laughs> if if know. people are curious about what this paper is, yeah. or that's right. That's he's right. just told the story behind it, and well, it is here in his book, Creation's Tiny Mystery. Well. One more item of this story needs to be told, 
and that's why I was waiting. But here it is, yeah. It's on page 223. I'll tell you the title in just a minute. Okay. Anyway, this paper, uh, you know, they sent me then the copy, the copy edited version of the paper, and actually mm -hmm. I saw something, a little change I wanted to make. So what did I do? But the, the associate editor himself was still in the hospital, but I called the copy editor who was actually involved in copy editing my paper. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I have something here that, you know, I feel a small change is necessary. He said, well, just mark it down and send it in. I said, well, no, I'm only a few miles away. I'll just come down and see you. So mm -hmm. I did. And he was very, very friendly and cordial. And he said, what is it you want to put in here? And I just made a very, very small change and he wrote it in. He said, he threw it in the basket. It's in, you know, for publication. Mm -hmm. So um, I then got the, the proofs of the paper, mm -hmm. you know, the final version, printed mm -hmm. version, and mm -hmm. it was going to be printed in the magazine. They sent it to me. And there it was before me. I looked at it. Praise the Lord. You know, many, many miracles had occurred over a period of a year, over and mm -hmm. over and over again, to get this information uh, about the scientific evidence for these halos being mm -hmm. halos that were formed by primordial radioactivity out to the world. I didn't have God did it in there, but obviously the scientific evidence was there. So I thought, you know, this man, the associate editor, he has been so cordial, so kind, so everything. I've got to let him know what I appreciate, you know, what he did. Mm -hmm. And so um, I called and told him, you know, I would like to come down and see him. I didn't tell him all the information that I had. Mm -hmm. I thought he knew. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I went down to see him and I went up to his office and I said, hi, John. Hi, John. You know, I understand you're in the hospital. You're feeling well now. And he said, yeah, we had a little uh, sort of uh, conversation together there. And then he was, he had actually come down. He was sitting across the table from me, from here to there. And he sort of leaned over the table and he said, Bob, whatever happened to that paper you had in for publication? <laughs> <laughs> my, I, my blood drained from my face. I said, John, I said, here's the, here are the proofs of the paper right here. <laughs> it's about ready to be published. And now he, his face became pale, <laughs> like, I can't believe it, after all this time that I wasn't here and the paper came in and was accepted. Obviously, it was reviewed and passed for publication, and whoever the angel of heaven was in that office that <laughs> said, take it and publish it, it was on its way. But now John said, Bob, let me have that paper. And I thought, oh, oh no. I made a big mistake coming down here and telling him. Yeah. Anyway, went home and prayed about it, and uh, as Penny Lynn says... So you gave him the paper? I gave him the paper. Yeah. He took the paper. Mm -hmm. Now, was it possible at that point that he could have still pulled he it? He could have thrown it away. Yeah. He was fully in charge. Because it wasn't in print in the magazine. It hadn't been printed yet. Yeah. That's right. It had not been printed. Yeah. It was there scheduled for publication. I had the proofs yeah. of the paper. <laughs> Uh, and so forth. Probably all it would have taken was a telephone call to the editor of science. Mm -hmm. Well, the, he, had the, he had the ability. He was mm -hmm. associate editor. He didn't have to go any further. He mm -hmm. was the one who was de facto yeah. in charge oh, of I publication. Yeah. yeah, he was in charge he was of the acting. publication. He was acting yeah. as editor, yeah. Yeah. Uh, although he was associate editor. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, <coughs> pardon me, in a few weeks in May, <coughs> pardon me, mm -hmm. in a few weeks in May, it came out, and it's out. there reproduced All on page right. 223 of the book, What's Creation, the title Time, and Mystery. the paper? <clears throat> title of the paper is Fossil Alpha Recoil Analysis of Variant Radioactive Halos. <laughs> and enough, in other words, that tells the story of basically what it's all mm -hmm. about, but you have to know mm -hmm. a little technical information. Mm -hmm. But anyway... So you found these halos in, in various uh, types of... Uh, granites. Uh, of granite all over the world. Mm -hmm. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah. And now, just to, um, we who live out here know this is a very volcanic area, and all the rocks that are on the surface of the ground are volcanic. Mm -hmm. Are we go ever going to find halos in volcanic rock? No. And the reason is because it is because when you take a first of all, granite rock will give you a light-colored volcanic rock when it's melted and it resolidifies. The thing is that granite is a unique rock in that. The evolutionists said granite forms as a result of the cooling of magma deep in the earth. Mm -hmm. I challenged the entire scientific community to say that, in, to find or to prove that hypothesis. 
Granite, when it's melted and reformed, never comes back to the original granite. The mm -hmm. kind of volcanic rock, out, rock you have out here in the Northwest is from a rock like the granite, except it has a lot of darker minerals in it. Mm -hmm. And so when it, it, so when it melts and re-solidifies, it solidifies into something what we call a basalt or a volcanic rock. Mm -hmm. So no, there will never be any polonium halos, creation halos, mm -hmm. in rock that has been mm -hmm. melted and re-solidified. Mm -hmm. Now I've heard you describe <coughs> before the granite rocks as being like the bones of our body. The granite rock is the skeletal material of the earth. Mm -hmm. It's the skeleton of the earth and everything else rests on top of that and then there's right. the core underneath. But it's the granite rocks which are found around the world. Mm -hmm. Anywhere you can go you find these. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're under the crust of the earth mm -hmm. or under the surface but that's where you find the halos. That's exactly right. And again, you know, Hebrews 1.10, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Mm -hmm. God actually pointed out the foundation rocks as those that he called into existence. Mm -hmm. And that's where he put mm -hmm. the fingerprints of creation. Let me get back to the last part of, of what we were talking about, the actual publication of the paper. Mm -hmm. Again, John uh, took the paper and sent it in for publication. It was published. And here it is, here it is on page 223, 24, and 25 of my book, Creation's Tiny Mystery. Now, very, very quickly then, what did that, what happened as a result of that? Well, I was investigating other kinds of halos which related to creation itself. One kind in particular was a very large halo that I had found called a giant halo. Now, interestingly, I had been over to Europe on several occasions picking mm -hmm. up rocks and going to mineralogists all over Europe, University of Heidelberg in particular, to get samples of rocks and I wanted to investigate other types of halos, so to speak, and I wanted to get a large sample of rocks from all over the world. Just as I got through saying a few minutes ago, the halos are found in granites all over the world. That's the reason if I went to a place where they had a collection of granites from all over the world like they do in some of the old universities there in Europe like University of Heidelberg, that was enabled me, instead of me going all over the world myself, to actually accumulate the samples without having to travel the world over, except just going to some of these universities. Well, in 1967, I had gone over and collected samples from University of Heidelberg. And then during the period of time where um, I was continuing my work and after now the the paper had been published there in Science Magazine in May 1968. <clears throat> in the fall of that particular year, I had an opportunity to go through and start examining all the halos, all the samples that mm -hmm. I had from around the world. And I found one sample in particular that had what we call giant radioactive halos. Now, mm -hmm. I had been searching for those for many, many years and mm -hmm. praying the Lord would help me to find them. And there they were under the microscope. I bet you were excited when you found I that. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Here I'd been searching and searching and praying and praying. And there all of a sudden they were under the microscope. Uh, why were you searching for it? How did you know that there was a bigger halo that uh, you hadn't found yet? Well, from time to time people had said they had seen them. Mm -hmm. But whenever I went to where they said they had seen them, I picked up rocks, you know, from Sweden and other places, mm -hmm. but I never found them. I never could actually identify them, okay. but I still had the view that they were possibly going to be of great significance in terms of additional evidence for creation. Mm -hmm. Not that I necessarily needed it, but I felt if indeed the Lord had left something like that around, I felt it was my duty to try to investigate. Mm -hmm. Try to find it. So <clears throat> there I was looking under the microscope at these halos, giant halos, thought, where in the world have I been? And here they are in my own laboratory and I've been searching the world over. Where are they? <coughs> Pardon me. So in any event, um, being there in Washington, D.C., Patty Lynn said earlier, of course, the great advantage of being there is because you're at the center of mm -hmm. science, so to speak, from the United States mm -hmm. in one way or another. Anyway, I, because the United States Atomic Energy Commission was there in Washington, D.C., and because they have in, had at that time initiated a search for what we call unusual new elements, called super heavy elements. Uh, a new search was going on within the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission mm -hmm. and America's nuclear laboratories. So I had the idea one day that I would try to call the chairman of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, situated right there in downtown mm -hmm. Washington, and go and just talk to him and say, look, this is what I found, these giant halos. They mm -hmm. possibly could be evidence of something extraordinary 
possibly this new super heavy element, you know, that's beginning mm -hmm. to be searched for. So I called his office and I said, I'm Robert Gentry, physics department at Columbia Union College, a little college outside mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. and so forth. And I said, can an ordinary scientist such as myself speak to the chairman of the United States Atomic Energy <laughs> Commission? Well, she was a little taken aback, mm -hmm. but in about five or 10 seconds or whatever, she answered, well, yes. And I said, well, I want to talk to him about something I've found. And she said, well, he's going to be going to Berkeley this afternoon. I don't think there's any chance, but maybe I'll get him to call you. Mm -hmm. In fact, she did say he was going to call me. About a half hour later or thereabouts, 15 minutes, a half mm -hmm. hour later, I got a call from his associate, Justin Bloom. And Justin Bloom said, what is it you want to talk to the chairman mm -hmm. of the Atomic Energy Commission? In other words, you don't call every day for the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission without That's having right. some real reason. Who in the world do you think you are? <clears throat> so I started telling him about the work I was doing. And he listened cordially, kindly, and so forth, condescendingly. But when I told him that I just had that paper published in Science just a few months earlier, mm -hmm. That really caught his attention, and he said, what date, what was the publication date, what's the page, and so forth, and I told him. He said, well, in fact, we just had these bound volumes of science, new volumes come mm -hmm. in. So he goes over there to his shelf, and he pulls out the bound volume of science, which has my paper mm -hmm. in it, opens it up, and reads it. He's a nuclear scientist himself. Mm -hmm. Very, very quickly, he understands what I had done in general. He didn't understand all the implications, of course. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he said, well, this is really, really interesting. And then I said, well, on that basis, you know, I found these giant halos. Mm -hmm. And he really became interested mm -hmm. at that particular mm -hmm. point in time. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the long story, short story of it all is I went down there this afternoon before the mm -hmm. chairman left for Berkeley, and I took photographs of these giant halos with me down there to uh, the Atomic Energy Commission. And it turns out that after I got there five or 10 minutes, the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, Glenn Seaborg, came in the door. And mm -hmm. Justin Bloom had had a chance to mm -hmm. look at the halos themselves, and he immediately took my photographs, showed it to the chairman, said, look what Gentry has found. And the chairman said, I'll be blank. And uh, <laughs> so a great, great, great surprise mm -hmm. that indeed something like this even existed, much less had been discovered or found. And anyway, he basically asked, can I take these I got to go to Berkeley. Can I take these photographs and so forth? I want to talk to the people at Berkeley about what you have found. Mm -hmm. And so he did. Mm -hmm. Well, that led to me getting an appointment mm -hmm. for a seminar mm -hmm. at Berkeley National Laboratory, Lawrence mm -hmm. Radiation Laboratory at that particular time, and also an invitation to go down and speak at the Oak Ridge National mm -hmm. Laboratory. <coughs> now I'll continue up with my talk at what happened at Berkeley very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, Berkeley had the world's finest nuclear scientists work mm -hmm. with Glenn Seaborg over the period of mm -hmm. World War II and discovery of new transuranium elements and so forth. So um, one particular person uh, that he worked with most of the time was Al Giorso, Lawrence Radiation Laboratory. And the first night I got there, I went in to see Giorso and another scientist, Matanermia at the Hylac, mm -hmm. heavy ion linear accelerator. And I had a copy of that paper I just published a few months earlier. And I gave a copy to Matty and Ermey, and then Al Gorso came mm -hmm. in and he read the paper. And he asked me immediately, because having the background that he did, he asked me immediately, what were the implications of what mm -hmm. I was saying? And mm -hmm. I said, well, I, I was still doing work, I don't want to tell you. He asked me the second time, after he read it the second time. Then uh, he asked me again. Mm -hmm. And I said, I didn't want to tell you because I'm still working and I did not want, at this particular time, of course, for Al Giorso to call Glenn Seaborg and say, Gentry's found evidence, what he thinks is creation. But anyway, I told him, I said, all right, you asked me three times, I think, it's evidence for a fiat creation. God left his fingerprints yeah. in the rocks of the earth. He really hit the ceiling. He <laughs> said, you know, he had grown up in a yeah. very strict uh, religious background situation, mm -hmm. and he had thrown it all over board, he'd become an atheist and so forth, argued with his wife about religion all the time, mm -hmm. and just went on and on and on and on read the paper again and peppered me with questions, you know, mm -hmm. for another hour or two that night. Then we left, he was not happy. Anyway, he came back the next morning. First time I saw him, he came into the laboratory, just like across the room here, and looked at me and turned around and left. Second time he came in, looked at me and turned around and left. 
third time he came in with a big cup of coffee in his hand and a smile on his face came over directly to me in front of my face and said, I want you to know, I stayed up half the night last night wow. trying to think of another explanation. Uh -huh. I can't do And it. he couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. All right. Uh, our time is almost gone. Would you like to hold up your book again and uh, tell folks where they can get your book, Creation's Tiny Mystery? Yes. Um, PO, you can write to Earth Science Associates, P.O. Box 12067, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37912. Or simpler, you can go to our website, www.halos, H-A-L-O-S, Dot com or call 1-800-467-6380. All right, and Patty Lynn, you've got some DVDs. There are three crea uh, fingerprints of creation, the young age of the earth, mm -hmm. and center of the universe. All right, so a lot of very interesting reading and uh, watching. If you've got, everybody's got a DVD player now, so it should be easy to uh, play these DVDs. But well, we want to thank you for being here today and we're looking forward to the last segment <laughs> which uh, we're going to air next week and uh, we're going to have a trip to Russia. So be sure and come back. I want to welcome back at this time uh, Dr. Bob Gentry. He is a creation research physicist and for many years he's been studying the age of the earth. And also we have his daughter um, Patty Lynn Guthrie with us today. And uh, Patty uh, grew up in a household of a research scientist. So uh, she, has, she knows uh, very uh, well what uh, Bob Gentry has been through in getting his papers uh, publicized. And today we're going to uh, make good on a promise we had a couple of programs back. We're finally going to get to his trip to Russia. So uh, Bob, uh, we, we uh, talked about the public publishing your papers and uh, how God had led through that and the many uh, contacts that were made. And I think one of those was a contact in Russia. I don't know, how, how did that Russian contact uh, come about? Let me back up just a little okay. bit. Pick up on what we said at the last part of the last program. Remember I was out at Berkeley and I was giving seminars out there and on the second day I was there, I had a seminar with some of the world's outstanding nuclear physicists and chemists. And remember, the essence of what we're doing, the background of issue here is this evidence that we're talking about. Is it really scientifically valid? Is it something that we can present to the world as saying, the God of heaven looked down the ages and saw that in these last days, evolution was going to be competing with the Bible, overthrowing the Bible. Has God actually put something here from 6,000 years ago to show indeed He knows what He's talking about mm -hmm. in the Bible? So it was very important when I went out on this particular trip, I've already enunciated the interaction I had with one very prominent nuclear physicist, mm -hmm. but the second day I was there, I had this seminar with a whole group of them. And as they saw, you, you can see the picture of this mm -hmm. whole series of halos right here mm -hmm. on the back of my book. I had an eight and a half, eleven, big photograph of this group of halos. And as I was presenting the seminar and I brought out this particular photograph, two reactions occur. And they understood the half-lives of these halos are only three minutes. And so therefore, whatever is going to happen to happen is going to happen within that time frame where it's all over. Or there wouldn't be any halos, wouldn't be any imprints in mm -hmm. the rocks. One of them, in the midst of that seminar of these world-renowned scientists said, the decay properties of the polonium, which is basically what formed these halos, polonium-218, he said the decay properties had to be different in times past than it is now. Basically what he was saying is, I'm throwing away everything I've ever done, all my publications, everything mm -hmm. I believe in terms of nuclear physics. Now I'm going to say the decay properties of polonium, the half-lives, have got to be different. Now he wanted to say they were going to have to be much, much, much longer in order mm -hmm. to incorporate their existence of the halos into the granite rocks all over the world. The other one, after he looked at this photograph with all these halos, he sort of leaned back in his chair after looking at it, and he said, you know, he said, that's enough to make a believer out of you. <laughs> in other words, these men with their scientific knowledge of physics and chemistry and nuclear physics, they caught the implications very, very quickly that mm -hmm. second day. Well, 
That meant, of course, that no one made any negative comments to the chairman of the AEC. Mm -hmm. They made positive comments to him. And so therefore, yes, I was in touch with a, mm -hmm. a Soviet scientist by the name of E.V. Shredensev. Mm -hmm. And so um, the Soviets were also starting their work of searching for super heavy elements. Mm -hmm. Well, I indicated that if possible, I would like to go over to Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, getting into Russia at that time in 1969, was a virtual impossibility. Mm -hmm. I was an unknown in science except for that one paper and except for the fact that I'd been to see the chairman of the AEC and he had become interested and now Berkeley mm -hmm. scientists were becoming interested. Anyway, it turns out that he wrote a letter from his office under his signature to the chairman of the Soviet Academy of Scientists, mm -hmm. Soviet Academy of Sciences, and saying basically here was a man you know has been doing some interesting work interest of interest to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. He has some things that he wants to um, investigate there in the Soviet Union with respect to this topic that we're all interested in about super heavy elements. Would you let him come in to the Soviet nuclear laboratory in Dubna, which was heavily guarded and mm -hmm. good big piece of Cold War at that particular time? And also to meet another scientist, member of the Soviet Academy of Sciences there in Russia. Well, they opened the door in the Cold War mm -hmm. era for mm -hmm. me or no one to go in, so to speak. Now, didn't you have an American scientist here write a letter of recommendation for you? How did that? That American scientist who wrote that letter of recommendation was no less than Glenn T. Seaborn, mm. chairman of the AEC. In other words, mm -hmm. he knew yeah. the chairman of the president, actually the president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. He knew him and he wrote a mm -hmm. direct letter he was, letter. he was the one in the previous segment that Dad had gone to meet. He was flying out to Berkeley that day. Yes, His yeah. assistant, Justin Bloom, had called and talked with him. Who are you that you would want to speak with Dr. Mm -hmm. Seaborg? And when Dr. Seaborg, coming out of his office, had seen the pictures of the halos was so mm -hmm. fascinated by what he had found, said, mm -hmm. can I take this with me? Yeah, and yeah. so he was the one who wrote the letter of recommendation. Okay. So it was his name, really, mm -hmm. that I think oh, opened no the door for someone who was relatively mm -hmm. unknown mm -hmm. to get to go to Russia. Was this a common thing at that time that American you scientists know, were I doing mean, an exchange with Russia? I mean, it's virtually off the map that someone, you know, of my unknown status, even mm -hmm. those who are known, you know, mm -hmm. you had to go through a long process of mm -hmm. validating this, validating that, and on and on before you get into the... Mm -hmm. into Can you tell us about what happened once <clears> you got there? Well, the Soviet scientist there in Moscow, Vibir Shredensev, is that well, I found out after I got there, <coughs> <pardon me. coughs> found out after I got there, he was the sole member of the Soviet Academy of Sciences who was a Christian. Mm. And anyway, interacted with him for the whole week, the first week I was there in Moscow. And then, uh, the beginning of the second week, they had a limousine come by and pick me up at Hotel Metropole, which is where I was staying, mm -hmm. and take me to the Soviet nuclear laboratory in Dubna. There, basically, you know, they were quizzing me very, very strongly about the implications of the halos and what I'd found, and they, uh, pro they provided an opportunity for me to speak to virtually the whole staff mm -hmm. at the laboratory in Dubna, about three or 400 nuclear scientists, and so I described the evidence for basically creation in mm -hmm. these polonium halos, but I didn't say at the end, you know, this is evidence for creation, for fiat creation. My lecture was being translated from Russian, pardon me, from English into Russian by a scientist, a, a nuclear scientist who knew English at that particular mm -hmm. time. Anyway, during the process of me speaking there to this group of nuclear scientists, one of the nuclear scientists at the end, just about at the end, stood up and he was rather agitated now, I couldn't understand exactly what he was saying, <clears throat> but from the reaction, his agitation made it evident that he understood basically what I was saying, that the rocks themselves basically had to be informed almost instantly, and it had overthrown, you know, everything about the Big Bang, geologic evolution, and everything else. And the other scientists, you know, as I was looking out the audience, they were catching the implications. I couldn't understand all the Russian he was saying, but the interpreter, basically was, he was defending what I was saying as basically being of scientific validity. In other words, see I had that 1968 yeah. paper that had been published mm -hmm. and there it was, I was reviewing that and so forth. And um, in any event, things went extremely well in Russia in terms mm -hmm. of 
interacting with uh, the people there at the Soviet Nuclear Laboratory. Did you I, feel safe when you were there just walking on the streets, staying in your hotel? What was that like? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I passed lightly over that first week there in Moscow. Um, got into Moscow, even though Vivi Shredensev, the Soviet scientist there in uh, the Soviet Academy of Sciences, met me and took me to the hotel and everything. Right after I, I said, we would like to have your passport. We would like to have your passport. This was at the hotel? This is, when you check in at the hotel, we would like to have your passport. Mm -hmm. I said, you want my passport? This is how I get out of the country. Yes, we need your passport. And so Shredensev said, yes, it's okay. Let them have your mm -hmm. passport. They want the passport for the entire night. They don't want it just to look at. So I said, all right. They wanted to make sure you stayed in your hotel. That's <laughs> common today, too. Yeah. When you travel overseas, <laughs> they'll take your passport overnight. Anyway, um, I went up to my room. And they showed me the room and so forth. I had not gotten into the room five minutes <clears throat> before. Bang, 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 bang. <clears throat> I thought, what in the world is going on? And <clears throat> oh, oh, we, we just we, we, we just want to see. In other words, they wanted to find out if I'm still in the room after five minutes. <clears throat> <laughs> well, the next day um, I had some time. Uh, Shredensev had something else to do. So I decided I was going to take a little stroll around Moscow. And I had mm -hmm. a camera. <clears throat> well, Two or three things of interest, uh, you know, caught my attention and so forth. So I was wandering around taking pictures of various buildings. Then I went to a street, one of the wide streets there in Moscow. Put my camera up, you know, to a picture of a policeman. Boy, he got his baton. Nyat, 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 nyat. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I put the camera down very, very, very quickly. And I noticed that in walking around Moscow that day and other days that... <clears throat> I just happened to glance back and I could see the same person many, many times, <laughs> the same person. I can see him in the background, you know. Uh -huh. Anyway, he probably knew that I saw him, but I didn't go anywhere without yeah. um, someone watching over me, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Then <clears throat> I could detail other things. One other, one, other one other interesting point, very, very slight point, was that you went, I saw this what apparently was a soft drink machine there. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh, this is interesting. I wonder what the drinks taste like, you know. And I didn't see any bottles of any kind. It just sort of a, a fountain where you push the button and the stuff comes out. You put in a certain amount of money. And I looked and looked and looked and looked, and I finally figured out there was a cup on top of the machine. Everybody mm -hmm. drank from the same cup. Oh, my. <laughs> I said to myself, no, thank you. Anyway, on that particular weekend, as... Um, Many things happened during the week. Fushinitsev took me out to the various uh, Russian interesting cultural sites, John the Great or something like that, who threw his son into the sea or whatever, or into the lake, was, read, was uh, presumed to have done that. Anyway, that particular uh, weekend, I went to the church, and I tried to find a, a um, taxi to take me to the church and had great difficulty until I found someone in the Soviet uh, agency there, the airplane, airplane agency, and they got a taxi for me, took me to the, the church. Then that afternoon, I, there was a very kind Russian family that took me to their apartment. And the process of going there, uh, the gentleman said, now, brother, we will walk separately. My wife will walk here. My wife, you know, we'll walk here and so forth. We'll get on the subway, get on the subway for a while, and then we get off the subway for a while, get back on the subway for a while, and make all sorts of changes. And we finally get to the area near where they lived. And he said, brother, you know, you will do this, you will do this, and we will go separately. You know, we finally get together. Then that night when we went back, again, it was the same sort of cat and mouse situation. Mm -hmm. You go here and you go there. You don't travel together, so to speak. Anyway, as I was traveling, as we were walking back after the subway to get back to the Hotel Metropole, we were walking by this uh, building. And I said, well, you know, I had been by this building during the week. I hadn't tried to take a picture of it. He said, brother, that is the headquarters of KGB. Oh, why? And he said, many good Russians have perished here. Hmm. Anyway, we went back to the hotel, and he, I mentioned to him I had brought a book, Prophets and Kings, with me, mm -hmm. and I said I would give it to him. So I went up to the room. I could tell somebody had been in the room. Mm -hmm. I got the book, brought it back down, and this was now May Day, 1969, mm -hmm. and the streets of Moscow were crowded. Pictures of Lenin everywhere, oh, okay. so to speak, uh -huh. and also the Great Revolution. Anyway, we went down, and there's a park right in front of the Hotel Metropole. 
And there are a lot of people sitting in the benches and talking and talking and talking, not knowing any more than I did or thinking any more than I did. I brought this book mm -hmm. just in my hand. And he was sitting on the bench, this Russian Adventist who had been kindly mm -hmm. taking me around or bringing me back, back downtown. So I just walked up to him and I said, here, brother, here's the book. <laughs> he leaped up from his seat and said, come, brother, we must walk. In other words, in the midst, he, he was afraid, you know, I'd blown everything. Mm -hmm. And so we began to walk around the circle of this little park here. He said, brother, you must, must, must be more careful. He said, you know, uh, we are being watched. That's all there is mm -hmm. to it. He said, I still want the book. He said, put the book under your coat like this. And I was still carrying it like that. Put it under the coat. And we walked to the dark side of the park. And when we get to an appropriate place, he brought a briefcase for the purpose of this. He said, when we get to a certain place, he said, I will say, now. And at that time, he said, I will open my briefcase very quickly. And you throw it in. Mm -hmm. Just almost, you know, like an instant of time. Mm -hmm. So indeed, that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a, a lesson in security that <laughs> night that's that right. I don't care about repeating. But yeah. in any event, um, I, I don't have time to go into all the details mm -hmm. of the many things that happened in Russia that mm -hmm. were providential. But mm -hmm. it, it turns out I met also the leader, the director of the Soviet Nuclear Laboratory in Dubna when I was there. Mm -hmm. He was quite interested in the halos after he heard, of course, my presentation, and later I found out that he set a part of his whole laboratory at work to see if he could verify or find anything wrong with the work on mm -hmm. the halos, and of course he didn't find anything at all. But in the context of leaving then the Soviet Union, remember the giant halos we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. At that time I didn't know where they came from, mm -hmm. and I had been praying and praying and praying for many, many months. Mm -hmm. Where in the world, Lord, did this sample of mm -hmm. rock come from? I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. How did they get there? How, well, yeah. where did the rock come from? Yeah. And how did they get there is true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to, uh, I had rock samples from all over the world. I thought they may have come from Japan and I was ready to leave Europe after everything was over and go to Japan and climb some mountains and see if mm -hmm. I could find it. But anyway, I went through uh, Finland and got samples there. Went to Sweden and got samples at the Natural mm -hmm. History Museum there in Stockholm. Then went over to Norway and went down to the mountains of Norway and Christian Sun, got samples there. Then went over to Ireland, to Dublin to get more samples. Mm -hmm. I was about ready to come back home and I called the scientist that I had earlier seen back in 1966 near Christmas time. And he said, 67, and he wanted to see me. So mm -hmm. I went back from Dublin to Germany and to the University of Heidelberg. Now the old University of Heidelberg was there back in 67 when I was there the first time. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, in 69, New University of Heidelberg, Max Planck Institute. Mm -hmm. They had transferred tens of thousands of mineral samples from the old University of Heidelberg to the new University of Heidelberg. And you're still looking for one particular sample, still thinking you're going to go climb mountains in Japan and find it. Yeah, yeah but I, when I went back to the University of Heidelberg to see Professor Ramdor, who had been there for 50 years collecting mineral samples from all mm -hmm. over the world, I had no idea he had any idea about the giant halos. I was just going back there to get more samples, plus the fact that he said he wanted to see me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd seen him years earlier, and, we, and I wanted to talk to him about the implications of the halo and sh halos mm -hmm. and show him this paper that had been published mm -hmm. in Science. <coughs> Pardon me. So I, I did, and I was there in his office, and, and we were talking about the new university, of, new Max Planck Institute at the University of Heidelberg. And it was similar to a table like this, except it was a circular table. I was sitting mm -hmm. on one side, he was sitting on the other side, his desk was on the other side of where he was sitting. And we chatted for a while and I told him specifically about the polonium halos and how I had found, and I was very direct with him and indicated I did not find any evidence of any secondary radioactivity for these halos. Mm -hmm. And the half-life was very, very, very short. <coughs> Pardon me. And so, Half-life was very, very short. So as we pursued this, he became quite interested. But then again, he said, well, there are many things here, you know, that need to be studied. He, he did not really get too excited about the implications because he felt like he needed to go back and do more research. He needed to actually mm -hmm. read the paper and, of my research and so forth. So he gave me some samples, samples similar to the ones he had given me before that I knew about 
both from Christiansand mm -hmm. and also in Sweden. And I was getting ready to leave, just about to stand up getting ready to leave. And then he said, by the way, I've got another sample I want to give you. But he said, it doesn't have any halos in it. Mm -hmm. And he puts over on the desk the other half of the sample that I had back in my desk at Columbia Union College. Oh my. The other half of it, and he said virtually the same thing here in May of 1969 that he said earlier in December of 1967, gave me that piece of mica mm -hmm. from the granite in Madagascar, and he told me then in 1967, I don't think it has any halos in it. So when I went back home in 1967 from my trip to Europe, mm -hmm. I threw it in a drawer there, mineral in a drawer with all my rocks in it, mm -hmm. and I didn't even write down where it came from. Mm -hmm. I just completely forgot about it mm -hmm. because he said it didn't have any halos. Mm -hmm. Then I felt sure it didn't have any halos, and there was no reason for me to try to go and look until the day came in the fall of 1968 where my prejudices against the rock were all gone, yeah. mm -hmm. and I began to look in every sample that I had, regardless of whether it had an ID on it or not. And so I thought to myself, you know, there's only one way to explain this. Mm -hmm. The angels of heaven interacted the first time and got Professor Ramdor to give me a piece of rock, of the mineral sample, biotite, that he said didn't have any halos. That was an impossibility of situation to begin with because he knew the only reason that I came to see him was to get samples which did have halos. And here again, May 1969, he's saying the same thing. And now all of his rocks had been transferred from the old University of Heidelberg to the new University of Heidelberg. So the angel of heaven, on two occasions, had that man go and pick out a sample of the same rock and the other half of the rock. Mm -hmm. So when I came back to America, I now knew where the rock came from. I didn't know mm -hmm. the answer to the, what caused the giant halos. Mm -hmm. But now, as a result of that, when I went back to America, I was now given the opportunity to go down and have a seminar, similar to the one I had at Berkeley, at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And there I could say, you know, here we have a sample with the giant halos. That's what caught everybody's attention. I explained the polonium halos, but they didn't try to question me about the implications of the polonium halos. Now, did they understand, you know, that what I was saying implied, you know, the possibility of creation? I'm sure it crossed their minds. Mm -hmm. But that did not stop them from inviting me to be a guest scientist at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory for a year from Columbia Union College because now I had the giant halos, not only had the giant halos, but I actually knew where they came from, and they knew that I could come to the laboratory, I could investigate, and potentially publish a paper mm -hmm. on these giant radioactive halos. This makes me think, this text that he read at the beginning, the, the foolishness, you know, the mm -hmm. little things mm -hmm. confound, to confound the wise, the very little things, yeah. the simple things that God has put, and what a simple, tiny, microscopic thing yeah, that had a such a... Rock a big impact in your future yeah. in going to Oak Ridge National Laboratory. That's what caused the laboratory, Glenn Seaborg, and many, many, many others, you know, to start really paying attention to this work. Went to the laboratory from Columbia Union College for one year, they said. They wanted to see, you know, whether I was genuine or not. The very next year, that was in the summer of 1969, the very next year, in going to the laboratory, immediately mm -hmm. started doing the experiments using the world-class scientific equipment there. Mm -hmm. And the first paper that I published mm -hmm. was in 1970, just, you know, several months after arriving there. And it was on, guess what? Giant radioactive halos. Giant mm -hmm. radioactive halos. Mm -hmm. And it's reproduced here in my book on page 226. Mm -hmm. Giant radioactive halos, mm -hmm. indicators of unknown radioactivity question mark. Mm -hmm. Well, I had succeeded in using the equipment there at the laboratory, and here are some of the photographs you can't see very well. Mm -hmm. But if you get my book, you can see there are actually color photographs of the giant halos as well as the polonium halos as well. So what do you think <coughs> these halos, someone used <coughs> a, this phrase, the title of, of uh, the video here, how did this title come about, the fingerprints of creation? Where did that come from? Well, the fingerprints of creation came as a result, uh, after going to the laboratory and publishing many papers and mm -hmm. the reports 
that I published in the laboratory are here, more and more evidence for the creation implications of the polonium halos that we've been talking about. At the end of the decade, the beginning of the next decade, 1981, the state of Arkansas passed a law requiring the teaching of creation science. Mm -hmm. ACLU challenged the law, and the state then was looking around for someone who could help defend the law, mm -hmm. and they looked at me. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I prayed, Lord, if this is what you want us to do, and go and mm -hmm. present this published evidence for creation, help us to know. Mm -hmm. Well, I got a call one morning to the effect that indeed they wanted me to yeah. come and testify. Yeah, well, what happened? Now, this is exactly what I wanted to happen that indeed the world attention not only was focused scientifically but publicly now on this evidence for creation, these polonium halos, the fingerprints mm -hmm. of creation here. Mm -hmm. And so it came to prime time attention there at the laboratory, pardon me, at the trial. They brought in a world-class geologist and under the witness, on the witness stand they asked him about the polonium halos, the evidence for creation we've been talking about. He said, Gentry has found something you know, I cannot understand. I call it a very tiny mystery which someday I would like to have the answer to mm -hmm. on the witness stand. Mm -hmm. So he emphasized that and also the fact that geologists could not duplicate granite, they cannot duplicate the polonium halos. And so on the witness stand we have then evolution's utter failure to explain the evidence for creation. Interesting. And this is an ongoing discussion in many states to oh, this I'm day. Oh, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. And it's, uh, I've, I've never heard this before. It's, it's, it's uh, just fantastic. Well, the reason you haven't is because once that happened, then my friends at the laboratory who had been friends with me now for 12 and a half years, and by the way, the laboratory invited me to become a staff member of the laboratory on several occasions. Mm. I did not do it because I believe there was a possibility that mm -hmm. indeed something like mm -hmm. a, a trial was going to come up and I needed the opportunity mm -hmm. to be able to go and respond right. without being yeah. restricted. Okay, well, our time <laughs> is almost gone. Uh, the trial, folks, you'll have to read about that in the book. You wanna hold that book up and uh, one more time, let's give the folks an invitation uh, if they'd like to uh, purchase the book. Uh, quickly give us the, uh, uh, where they can, where they can right. purchase the book. <clears throat> Phone number is 1-800-467-6380. The website is www.halos.com and the address is Earth Science Associates, P.O. Box 12067, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37912. All right, and Patty, you've got some DVDs. <laughs> there are three. The first is Fingerprints of Creation, describing the halos in the rocks. The Young Age of <clears throat> the Earth features many fascinating uh, evidences for a young age of the Earth. And most recently, we haven't discussed that on this show, but the center of the universe, it's a macrocosm, the mm -hmm. whole universe. It's mm -hmm. very, very interesting. All right, there's material for many hours of uh, interesting, interesting reading and uh, discussion there. <coughs> well, I wanna thank you folks for coming and being with us here, and uh, may God bless as we seek to find the uh, answers to some very puzzling questions that have uh, been plaguing the world for many, many years.